Flying Man in the Usuri Taiga, Kabarov's resident, Dmitry Nikovnov, although he does not believe in all kinds of devilry, spoke about this incident with a trembling voice. Together with a friend, he traveled along the Bikin River, which flows into the Usuri. One night, they heard some prolonged, strange screams that sounded like a woman crying. Moreover, the source of the sound did not stand still, but moved. Screams and howls were heard from one place or another, and the source of the noise seemed to bounce around. They were not able to pinpoint its exact location at all. The travelers, as Dmitri admitted, experienced chilling fear. Then, having arrived already in Vladivostok, they heard a story about a flying man, supposedly living in the wilds of the Asuri Taiga, in the southern part of Primorai. What kind of mysterious creature lives in the coastal Taiga? This question, by the way, was asked by the famous researcher of the Asuri region, V. K. Arsenyev. This is what he wrote in one of his books. My dog was trailing behind me. On the path, I saw a bear's footprint, very reminiscent of a human one. My dog bristled and grumbled, and after that, someone or something quickly rushed to the side, breaking the bushes in the process. Alma pressed herself tightly against my legs. At that time, something happened that I did not expect at all. I heard the flapping of wings. A large and dark mass emerged from the fog and flew over the river. The dog expressed obvious fear and huddled at my feet the whole time that it was happening. At this time, screams were heard, similar to the screams of a woman. In the evening, the huge began to animatedly discuss the version of the tale, that in these places lives a person who can fly through the air and has his own pair of wings. Only a notorious skeptic would not be able to believe this testimony of Vladimir Kladivich Arsenyev. Arsenyev had a great scientific reputation within the community and was respected by his peers and all of those that knew him. Arsenyev valued his reputation and held the respect had for him very dearly. Why would he risk something so dear to him by fabricating a silly story about a man with a pair of wings. It would not make sense. Hunters talk about this creature, allegedly spotted in the area of the Padan and Oblaknaya mountains. It was heard more than once in the 1940s and 1940s in these parts. This fact is also known. In 1944, six soldiers, led by a sergeant major, worked on a farm near Yekaterinovka, southern part of Primorai. One evening, two of them were returning on a cart with food from the village. Not reaching three kilometers to the farm, the soldiers saw a huge, luminous ball descending to the ground. At the moment the ball landed, heartbreaking, piercing, female screams were heard. Abandoning the cart, the guys rushed to the farm, after that, they were terrified of the dark and talked about the flying man. Alexander Rempel also recorded the story of Hunter A. I. Kurentsova. At night, the hunter suddenly woke up with the feeling that he was being watched. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw something huge and dark rushing towards the fire. Turning over onto his back to avoid a collision, the hunter saw a man flying above him, almost touching the ground. Current Sova remembered the membranous wings, similar to the wings of a bat. He quickly jumped up and hid behind the trunk of the nearest tree, from where he did not emerge until dawn. In the morning, he examined everything around the area, but found no traces of the creature or any traces of a disturbance. The Ivansky family experienced an even more terrible fear. Late at night, they were awakened in their hut by an unusually loud chirping, 
similar in timbre to the song of a cricket. The cricket, however, quickly fell silent. The head of the family discovered that the sound was coming from under the bed, and saw under it an unusual creature huddled against the wall, either a dog or something else entirely. They tried to lure him out, but it did not work. The Ivanskis began throwing slippers under the bed. The dog jerked and suddenly threw forward its long trunk with which it tried to grab the legs of its owners. At this point, the frightened family was forced to defend themselves and hit the creature with anything that they had nearby, and the children sprayed aerosol cans at it. The creature shrank, rolled into the far corner, and fell silent. Finally, they pulled him out from under the bed and saw him. It was the size of a small dog, had short bluish hair, two free-toed paws, and hard wings about one and a half meters long, shaped like the wings of a bat. The creature's muzzle looked like a human face mask, cast in plaster, almost flat, with a large forehead not covered with hair, very large eyes, and a tiny, lipless mouth. Instead of a nose, the creature had a triangular hole. It was apparently already dead. He was thrown into a hole left by the builders. Later, the hole was filled up. What was that? What is true in the story, and what is possibly fiction? It is impossible to establish this today, since the story is old, and researchers have no evidence of what happened. But the real sensation can be considered the testimony of tourists from the group of Alexander Lazarev, who made a stop at Mount Pidan. Tourists saw a man flying from the mountains on a hang glider. The winged design of the hang glider and the stranger flying in the aircraft, it looked like a child, attracted a lot of attention. The video camera brought the flying man closer, and the operator suddenly saw that it was not a hang glider at all. The video camera film left an image of the unusual face of a winged creature, perhaps a huge bat unknown to science, with an almost human face. In the winter of the same year, four hunters from the village of Tegrove were relaxing by the fire. They heard a terrible noise near a small lake. Interested, they took a gun and flashlights, called the dogs, and went to the lake. When approaching the shore, the dogs howled, tucked their tails, and clung to the people. Let us remember that V. K. Arsenya describes the same reaction of a dog when meeting a flying creature in almost the same way. Near the tree, people saw a human figure about one and a half meters tall. In the light of the lanterns, they saw a creature with huge, red-orange eyes and wing-like arms. The flying man flapped his wings and flew low between the trees. What, after all this time, has been living for hundreds of years, and maybe more, in the coastal taiga? A relic that has survived to this day. A mutant, an alien creature that visits the Asuri wilds from time to time. And not only these places, but also West Africa and the Sierra Madre Mountains in the New World, where cases of its appearance are also documented. Perhaps some day we will find out after all. Craig's story. He was a quiet guy, the type of guy you pictured one day taking a gun out and going on a shooting rampage. He never spoke, just came to the gym in his dull, dingy attire and quietly lifted. From what I saw, he was a 40-something-year-old guy who was overweight and worked out to somewhat keep in shape. Although he never bothered anyone, I noticed that he was the butt of many insults and jokes in the gym. Most of the members had given him the name Pigpen, since no one seemed to know his real name, and he never really conversed with members of the gym. He was quite simply an enigma in the gym. I was young, had been lifting for about four years or so. I thought I knew everything, thought steroids were evil, but I was enthusiastic 
and trained harder than the average gym-goer. Our gym, although well-equipped, was at its heart a fitness club. Most of the members were more concerned with their hair and clothing and being coordinated for the gym social scene. Pigpen simply stuck out like a sore thumb. I thought many times that he may know the things that people said about him. It was obvious to me, so I figured he must pick up on it. The members were cruel, a snicker here, a pinched nose there, all in jest of the quiet guy in his drab, baggy clothing. I didn't see it as funny, more like insecure bullying, but Pigpen simply ignored it and kept on. The owner was a friend of mine named Chris. He and I worked together at another gym. He had been a competitive bodybuilder, but had since gone into gym business and had a side business refurbishing homes. I usually spoke to Chris a couple of times a week when I saw him, usually on the way out after I had finished my workout. One such evening, I was at the front desk, talking with Chris and some of the front desk staff. Pigpen was walking by us to leave the gym. As he grasped the handle for the door, one of the staff made a coughing gesture and under his breath said, <coughs> Pigpen. Pigpen didn't ever flinch, but I saw his eyes cut to his right, and I knew he definitely heard it. He walked out the door without even a hitch. As the door shut, the girl at the front desk said to Chris, I don't understand why you even let him work out here. Chris looked at her with a glare and said calmly, As long as I am the owner, he will always be welcome here. Do you understand? She replied sheepishly, Yes. Chris wasn't even finished, and I could tell he was pissed, but he kept his cool and looked at the two of them and said, That guy has been through hell and back. You need to show some fucking respect. Just because your mommy and daddy pay your bills doesn't give you the right to judge someone that you cannot understand. They looked completely astonished and embarrassed, and they should have been. I asked Chris what Pigpen's deal was. Chris told us that Pigpen had been a successful guy at one time in his life. Good career, was a competitive bodybuilder, and had pro potential. So I asked what happened. Chris replied life. As Chris went on to explain, he had been raised by his father. He had no other family. His mother died when he was only a toddler. His father had developed a rare type of cancer. He had spent every penny he could, trying to get medical care for his dad and keep him comfortable. In the end, his father passed away and he lost a good bit of money. His wife left him and he had to quit competition. He went through a struggle financially after that and never really recovered. And then about five years ago, he was in a car accident and he was nearly killed. He was in a coma for several months. The insurance settlement was enormous enough to help pay for his rehab and get him financially set for life. But not to the point where he was living on the high hawk. Just enough to live off. We were all floored. I was speechless. I didn't even know what to say. Chris looked at me and said, If you ever want to know something about bodybuilding, that's the guy to ask. For several weeks after that, when I saw Pigpen at the gym, I really felt bad. I didn't even know how to look at him anymore. People still poked fun at him, and it made me upset, but I just kept my head down and trained. Then one day, I was doing chest, and Pigpen was right there, doing some seated dumbbell curls. He was only using fruities. Never made sense to me, how the guy looked like he was big, overweight, but big shoulders and chest. He must have weighed near 280 to 290. So I saw Pigpen pull up his long sleeve to scratch his arm. Guess the big fella had an itch. But what I saw was one of the biggest fucking forearms I have ever seen on a man. It was lumped with a system of hose veins. I was simply captivated by it. So I walked up to Pigpen after his next set and said, Excuse me. He turned slowly to look at me almost as if there was something wrong with his neck. I felt so nervous, I extended my hand and said, My name is Jay. He just looked at me. His face was almost expressionless. Chris had said he had gone through all that hard time, but he didn't mention if he was still mentally all there. Then he spoke. A gravelly voice said, Craig, my name is Craig. It was as if he had not been asked his name in so long that he had almost forgotten what it was. Then he shook my hand, 
with the most careless of hand I think I can ever remember shaking. He had a strong grip, and his hands were as muscular as his forearm. I asked him, how did you get your forearms so developed? Craig told me he went to another gym to train heavy, that it was an old powerlifting gym, and most of his forearm development had come from heavy deadlifts, rows, and shrugs. He asked me if I had ever done deadlifts, and I had, but not on the regular. He looked at me and said, gotta do dead skid. So you can understand, as I was young and impressionable, that the next back workout, I hit deadlifts right away. I was weak at them. I fought 315, was going to break my back, but I hung in there and pushed, or should I say, Paul. I noticed Craig had been watching me while I was doing them. After many months of practicing, I got very good at them. I was up to 475 on deadlifts, and my shoulders and traps were growing, and people kept mentioning my forearms. I was so impressed by the results from one simple thing that I went to Craig frequently to get advice from him. His advice was always so simple. Seemed like it was always too easy of an answer, but it was always solid advice. People in the gym still treated him like shit, but I was always cool to him. He had helped me out with great advice on many occasions, and in the last year and a half, I had gotten not only bigger, but much stronger too. I was beginning to have the look of an actual bodybuilder, and it was mostly due to the enigmatic man whom no one spoke to, except me. Then one day, as I was walking into the gym, Chris got my attention from his office, waving his hand for me to come over. So I came in, and Chris informed me that the powerlifting gym Craig went to was closed. He asked me if I had spoken to Craig. I said I hadn't seen him that day. He said okay, and I went back into the gym to lift. I thought that Craig must be disappointed his other gym would be closed. I looked back to the front, and I saw Craig talking with Chris. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but Chris kept nodding his head. They both walked to a locked set of double doors, where old, broken gym equipment was kept. After about 30 seconds, they both came out, and Craig had a chrome 50-pound bar for powerlifting. Craig walked up to me and said, Kid, you want to do some deads with me? I responded, hell yeah. We warmed up with 145H. Craig had the chrome bar, and I used a standard gym bar. I didn't know how long I would last with deads. The most I had done was 475, and that was one time. Had not touched it since. As of late, 455 was about as much as I could do. As we warmed up with two plates, I looked at Craig, and the weights looked like toys that he was picking up. For me, they were already feeling somewhat heavier. As I finished 405, I was feeling good. I had nailed 9 reps, which at the time was a good set for me. Craig was still just warming up. Then Craig looks at me and says, Come on, I need your help for a minute. We walk back to the other side of the gym, to the double doors. He goes in and I follow. In the storage room was a myriad of old stationary bikes, rusted bars, broken plates, and snap cables. I see Craig crouch down and pick up a large object. It looks like a 45 pound plate, but it says 100 pounds on it. He motions his head down to the place he picked it up and says, get the other one. I grab the rusty plate and it is thick and heavy, difficult to carry, but I'll be damned if I let Craig see me struggle with it. I carry it back to where our bars were and he puts one on each side of his bar. He squats down in front of the bar, rolls it back and forth in his grip, then with a sudden surge, peels the bar from the floor. I can hear the plates rattling, and he bangs out 15 reps. I don't know how much weight he had on the bar, but it had to be in excess of 600 pounds. I can't let him see me not go heavier, so I grab a 25 and start to put it on the bar. But before I can bend down to slide it on, Craig looks at me and says, shaking his head from side to side, Kid, and he's holding up his hand with five fingers showing. I look at him with a doubtful look and say, Five plates? Seriously? He simply nods in affirmation. So I return the 25 to the tray and grab a 45 pound plate, the whole time thinking, no fucking way. So I get ready to do my set. I shake my head with doubt and I hear Craig say, Kid, 
Don't let that boy punk you. Now, I don't know what it was about the way he said it, but I thought, hell no, I'm not going to let this fucker beat me down. I grabbed the bar. I took a deep breath and cleared my mind. I pulled up and back, and the bar came up and slowly ascended. It scraped my shins, and I could feel it hit my kneecaps, but the shit was moving, and I thought I might shit my pants. I stood straight up with the bar in hand, and then let the weight down with a crash. I was psyched. 495 was a new personal best. I looked at Craig, and he was actually smiling. He nodded and said, very nice. Some people had taken notice of what we were doing. The fitness gym crowd wasn't used to seeing big weights getting lifted like that. I saw Chris walking to us, and he had a yellow, rubber-coated, 100-pound powerlifting plate in his hand. He looked at Craig and said, Look what I found. Craig nodded and put the plate on the end of the bar. Chris looked at me and said, Jay, there's another one in my office. Can you grab it? I nodded and went to his office and grabbed the bulky plate, returning to them both and putting it on for Craig. Chris looked at the bar, then turned to Craig and said 810. Craig simply nodded. I could not believe my eyes. I had never seen a bar with that much weight on it. Craig stared at the bar. It was a cold stare. He was breathing deeply and exhaling slowly. It was like some meditation. He was going somewhere else, somewhere deep in his mind that he had to draw upon for strength. Onlookers had gathered. There must have been a dozen men and women looking on as Craig squatted down to grab hold of the bar. I could feel my own heart beating in anticipation. Then he methodically exploded up, his face turning a shade of red like I had never seen on him. His neck veins bulged out so far I thought they might burst. It was an awesome spectacle of raw power, but the even more impressive feat was that he did not do it only one time. No. He repped it six times, with the finally coming with an explosive crash that must have registered on a Richter scale. Craig remained prone for a moment, his breathing more like panting. He slowly recovered and stood, nodding his head. Then he looked over at me and said, Your turn, pointing to my bar with 495 still loaded. I looked at him in disbelief and said, Again? He looked at me blankly and said, No with more. I really did not think I could do any better than 495. That was a personal best, for God's sake. So I grabbed a 25-pound plate and looked at Craig with my eyebrows raised, as if to make sure it was enough weight to satisfy him. He nodded, and I put on two 25-pound plates, one per side. At this point, I was shitting my pants. No way I could do this. I would try it, but when I failed, I would just have to fail. Craig said something to me that I will never forget. He said to me, with a calm, like a parent to a child, Kid, that weight isn't shit. There's a lot worse things than that. I stood there for a moment, contemplating his words. Then it hit me. He was right. A weight is a simple, small thing. Life is an unfair motherfucker, and it will beat you down again and again. It's unpredictable and unyielding. This bar full of iron is just a thing. It's nothing compared to the difficulties of life. I grabbed the bar. I could feel a lump in my throat, and my adrenaline was pumping hard. I took hold of the weight and tightened my grip and straps around the bar, becoming one with it. The onlookers watched, but it was like that moment I was by myself, just me and the bar. Like a jolt of electricity, I yanked the bar up. It started to move, but stalled on my shins. Craig yelled up. I pulled. I could feel my heels digging in and my trap stinging. It slowly started to move, centimeter by centimeter. I pulled the bar up. It was as if it took 20 minutes, and then I had it all the way there. I could see that my face was blood red, and my veins in my neck were also pushing out. I dropped the weight and collapsed to my knee with it. I could hear people talking, but my ears were ringing. I recovered and stood up. As I looked around, Craig was smiling again, and looked at me saying, See? Chris came up and patted me on the back. I was amazed. I couldn't believe I actually did that. Now Craig got up. He walked over to the tree 
and grabbed two more 45s. He slid one on each end of his bar. I looked at him like I was watching a man be led to the gas chamber. Chris looked at Craig, calmly saying, 900 pounds, just like the old days, brother. Craig grinned and nodded in acknowledgement. Now there must have been 40 people back there just watching. There were odd whispers, people asking others how much it is, and others simply astonished that this silent giant possessed such strength. Craig kneeled down in front of that bar. It was like someone bowing down to an executioner. Then he stood up. Was something wrong? He reached down and pulled up the bottom of his sweatshirt and pulled it up and off. What I saw was unbelievable. The man was a mass of slabs of muscle and covered in tattoos. Down the backs of his arms were words. On the right arm, it read, I am nothing. And down the left, I feel nothing. His traps were like two huge camel humps, side by side, on the back of his neck. And he wasn't fat or overweight, no. He was just fucking huge. His body was like his hand. Lumps of callous muscles, from the years of pain and toil in his life and in the gym. It was simply unbelievable. Craig adjusted his belt and strapped back onto his bar. It was very quiet, and then I heard Chris say, you got this shit, Craig. People started cheering him on. I could hear people saying, Come on, Craig, you got it, bro. It was amazing. All the while, Craig was breathing very deep, very methodically, rolling the bar back and forth in his hands. He stared into the mirror. I don't know what he saw, but his nostrils started to flare, and he looked like he was getting pissed. His eyes started to well up, almost like he might cry, and he stared blankly at a spot on the floor just in front of the bar. Wherever he was, he was not with us. I imagine he was in that very dark place that his life had taken him, drawing upon a well of emotions, full of hate, anguish, and pain. It was as if he was channeling all of that into the bar. He was breathing harder, and he had not even lifted the bar yet. He was shaking all over. I looked to his reflection in the mirror and said, This is nothing for you, brother. He nodded and then growled, I got this shit. Then, it was as if his entire body uncoiled, driven by the hydraulics of his emotion. The bar bent, his traps were spotted with purple spots, for the hue of red he cried out, fuck you, and the weight stalled. I thought he may drop it, but his eyes closed and his face winced in anguish and the bar moved upwards. I don't know if it was the sweat from his face but I could have sworn tears came out of his eyes, and the bar traveled further up until he had it at midriff. He stood there and opened his eyes back up. They were bloodshot and tear-filled, and his pupils were so dilated that the blue of his eyes were gone, and it was pure black. It reminded me of one of those videos of a great white shark taking a bite. Then he and the bar dropped. At first, I thought he may have passed out, but he didn't. He put his hand up to let us know he was okay. People started to fucking clap. I looked around at them and couldn't believe what I was witnessing. As he knelt down, catching his breath, I walked up and crouched next to him and said, That was the most spectacular thing I have ever seen in my life. Nice lift, bro. He was still panting, but he nodded, so I know he heard me. Then one of the gym idiots yelled out, Damn, pig pen, get off the juice, dude. I swung around. I didn't even think about what I was doing. Some 40-year-old yuppie fuck with an Under Armour tank top and a fucked up stick physique. I grabbed him by his arm as he tried to walk away. He swung around, looking at me in surprise, and I looked him in the eyes and I said, His fucking name is Craig. C-R-A-I-G. Can you spell asshole? The idiot looked at me, embarrassed, and replied in a low tone. I'm sorry, man. His name is Craig. Then he looked at my hand, still grasping into his flesh, and I quickly let him go. I turned to look back at Craig, and he was sitting on the bench and staring at me. He just looked at me and nodded. I nodded back. Craig still went to the gym for about another year. I talked to him frequently about training and bodybuilding. I often reminisced about the day we did deadlifts. At this point, I was lifting 585 on deads and all because of Craig's tutelage. 
After that year, Craig disappeared. Chris told me he had not seen him, but heard he moved to another state. Craig and I only spoke at the gym. He had no cell phone. I had never seen his place, and I had never had any clue where he left. But though I barely knew the guy, I considered him one of my closest friends. The years went by, and I trained hard and entered my first show, even managed to make it to nationals. I always wondered what happened to Craig. I wanted to talk to my old friend and get his advice like I had when I was just starting out. He always had the simple answers. So many of the training gurus tried to make things complicated, and Craig just had a sentence or two to say and was spot on with his advice. Then one day, after a workout, I went home. There was a police car in front of my house. I walked up, and there were two officers walking towards me. They asked me if I was Jay. I told them I was. They informed me Craig had passed. I asked how. They told me he died in his sleep. So I asked them why they were telling me this, and the one officer replied that Craig had no known family members still living, and that his only will and testament stated that I was his next of kin. I didn't know what to say. They told me they were sorry for my loss, but I didn't even really hear them. They got in their car and pulled away. I stood motionless in my yard. Then I snapped out of the shock I was in and went inside. I called Chris to tell him, and he was saddened by the news. I sat down and reflected on my mentor of Young, the guy that no one understood, the person who people made fun of and taunted, and he had been one of the biggest impacts on my life. He was a man of very few words, but his words had such a great impression on me. I felt very saddened, like the world had just lost something very good, and didn't even realize it. The next day I was in a fog. I really had no clue how to act. My co-workers asked me if everything was okay. I told them, my good friend passed away yesterday. Later that week, I came to grips with my friend's death. I came home from work to find a mail envelope package on my doorstep. I opened it up, and it was a letter and several photos. I read the letter, and it was handwritten in pencil on notebook paper. Dear Jay, if you are reading this, I have died. My life was hard, very hard. For a long time I felt empty, and the gym was the only thing I had to remind me that I was still alive. The pain of working out and pushing myself reminded me every day that I was still alive. I have been keeping my eye in your competitive career and have seen some of your shows. I'm proud of you, kid. I always wanted to thank you, but I'm not very good at conversation, as you know. I wanted to thank you for the day we did deadlifts. That one day felt like I was a human being again. I felt the best I have felt in my entire life. You were a great inspiration to me at a time when I was losing hope. Thank you for being my friend. Your good bro, Craig. By the time I finished reading the letter, I was crying badly. I hadn't cried in years, but I was weeping like a baby. I looked at the photos from my shows. They were taken from the audience. Craig had been at my shows, and I hadn't even known it. I guess he was keeping his eye on me, making sure I was progressing, not sitting back being lazy. I don't know why exactly he was there, but he was there, and I'm glad that he got to see that. Under the photos was a legal document. It was Craig's will. I read through the legal jargon, and towards the end, it started to itemize all the belongings that Craig had left behind, and that since I was his only kin, that I would be getting these possessions. He left a sizable amount of cash, a truck, his house, and his personal belongings in the house. But the last item on the list was the most priceless of all. One chrome, 50-pound, powerlifting bar. 